What's up, everybody? All right, time for a midday market recap. Today's Friday. Happy Friday, everyone. So I am uh, excited that we're wrapping up the week, and I've hit my goal with a small account. Today is small account day four, and I made another $154 today. So that means I'm finishing the week up 106% on this small account, which is $618.51 in profit from my starting balance of $583. So not bad. My goal was to get to 1,000 by the end of the week, and I'm gonna open on Monday with $1,200. So I'm $200 ahead of my, um, my self-imposed self uh, target, which you know I am my biggest critic, and I am definitely uh, very competitive with myself. I want to do better than I did last time. So you know, my goal this week was to get to a thousand dollars. Certainly, by next week, I want to be at two thousand. That means I need to be two hundred fifty dollars a day. You know, more or less, and maybe I'll have a loss here and there. So, really, two hundred dollars, two hundred fifty a day is going to be the target next week. I actually haven't been able to break two hundred any day this week, so that may be a little too aggressive, but. I, you know, I think if I have good setups, I'll be able to do it. Um, so let me show you guys my P&L for today. Um, you can see here, this is on my um, my SureTrader account. So $154.54. Now, the realized profit was $219 before commissions. Commissions today were $65. So, you know, that was kind of the, the issue. I mean, I did break $200, but, you know, not after commissions. So... Why were commissions $65 and, you know, more than 30% of my profits? Well, today I, uh, I traded a little more than usual and I got a little bit more aggressive. And the stock that I got a little more aggressive on um, was, well, I got, I got a little aggressive on, on two setups, but really the one that I got most aggressive on in the small account was SKLN. So let's pull up the SKLN chart and I'll show you guys... Um, the, the thought process on this one. This stock went from 260 up to 340 in a matter of about 15 minutes. So, you know, that's a, that's a pretty significant move. It's like a 30% move in 15 minutes. That's big. And that right there is an opportunity. As a, as a day trader, that's an opportunity to capitalize on volatility and generate a profit. So someone in the chat room called it out. They're like, hey, check out SKLN. It's popping up. And I looked at it. And I was like, mm, yes, indeed, it is. I like the look of that. So let's see, let me pull this back. Um, I got in this for the break of $3. It was already up from 260 and it was up to 280 And I looked at it and I was like, okay, well, you know what? If this can break over $3, it's going to start to look really good on the daily chart for a breakout. And uh, also kind of keep in mind, Today we had a big runner, which was ETRM. And that was sort of the context of trading today, that we had this really big runner, but the problem with it, and I'll show you guys the chart here, the problem with ETRM is that it made the move pre-market. The move from $5 up to $7 was pre-market. Yesterday it was pretty active as well, but not easy to trade. It was selling off most of the day yesterday. So, you know, a big surge right out of the gates and then fading the rest of the day. So when we have a stock that makes a big move like this, we often get sympathy momentum. And sympathy momentum is when you have a stock maybe in a similar sector or just a similarly priced stock with a low float that starts to squeeze up because traders are like, ah, I missed ETRM, but I want to get a piece of something else. Now, I didn't trade ETRM in my sure trader account because SureTrader restricted it to one-to-one -one margin. So with a $1,000 balance, I could really only take about 125 shares of that stock. It's not even worth trading. I, I mean, I just, it doesn't even, it's just not something I'm even gonna touch. So didn't trade it with SureTrader and I just figured, you know, I'll wait for the first sympathy stock, the first stock that maybe starts spiking up, um, you know, on sympathy to this big move here on ETRM. So when I saw SKLN popping up, I was like, hmm, this might be the one. This is a stock that is a former runner, number one. It's a stock that, number two, has a low float. So number three, what's the catalyst? Well, that's kind of the issue. It didn't have a standalone catalyst aside from a technical breakout on the daily chart. 
but it was breaking out on the daily chart. Now, one of the things that I um, will talk about once I get my uh, 2016 account statements are all my trades from 2016. And one of the things I've already noticed looking through the reports um, that I have on TraderView is that almost 90% of the stocks that I was trading were trading on very high relative volume. High relative volume is typically the result of a catalyst. But in any case, relative volume tells us that a lot of traders are trading the stock. You've got average volume, which is here. And average volume is, is, is relative. It's what's average for Apple is not average for IBM. So each stock has its own relative volume, its average relative volume. So if it's trading above that, it's trading high on that particular day you know, for that stock. Every, almost every stock I traded in 2016 was having a high volume day relative to what's normal for that company. That's, a, that's important. Traders like myself, day traders, like all of you guys, we're looking for stocks with high volume. We're looking for stocks that people are interested in. So my process each day for finding these is, of course, using the scanners and looking through those scanners. Now, the first thing I can do is, uh, is filter out all the stocks that I know I don't care about. I'm going to filter out IBM. I'm going to filter out Apple, Facebook. Those are stocks that you can't really day trade. They're not easy to day trade. So the easiest way for me to filter those out is to use a float filter. So first, I only look at stocks with a float of under 100 million shares. So everything else is gone. So that essentially weeds out, you know, 80% of the stocks on the market. You get 7,000, now we're down to maybe 1,000 or 500 or something like that. And then we, do, we go and add another filter, which is, does this stock have high relative volume? All right, so if it has high relative volume, now it's going to filter it down even more. So when you look at stocks with a float of under 100 million shares that have two times their relative volume, so this is average and they're trading here on the, on the day, now your list is even smaller. Now we go through that list and we try to figure out, okay, of these stocks, which ones have the most volume, which ones have the lowest float, or which ones have the best daily chart? And almost any on any given day, I've narrowed that list down to about... 25 stocks and I can go through those and choose four or five that I think have potential and SKLN today was one of those stocks It came up on my scanners as having low flow and spiking up. It was moving up very quickly So I jumped in it at uh, three or sorry 290 for the break of three dollars now on this one Excuse me. I only took 500 shares. I didn't get really aggressive because I kind of felt like well Usually I take my first trade sometime between 9.30 and 10. So to be taking my first trade at 10.15, it kind of already tells me that maybe I'm not on today or that the market's just slow. And it is Friday after all. So I was like, I'm going to just start a little smaller. I want to end the week strong and not do anything stupid. So 500 shares in at 290. We pop up to a high of 310. And then we squeeze up to a high of 317. Actually, we go up as high as, let's see, my mouse is stuck here. We go up as high as 323. So, you know, a quick, almost a quick 10% profit right up. Now, I sold as it came back down and locked in uh, about 15 cents on 500 shares. So about $75 in profit. And I was like, okay, so I had one entry, that's $5 commission, and then I sold one half, so I sold 250 shares, and then I sold another 250 shares. So that's $15 in commission just on that trade between my one entry and my two exits. $15 plus the ECN fees. So it was about a $20 commission, and that meant after that trade, I only had about $50 of profit. You know, it was a good setup, but only $50, which is the tough thing. So I was like, okay, whatever, that's fine. It's, you know, a little, a little something. Maybe I'll get back in. Now, on the candle at 1018, I decided to get back in for the first one minute candle to make a new high. And this is a setup I use all the time. So you've got uh, the, the squeeze up, the first red candle. Now, the first green candle, the first candle to make a new high is my entry. Stop is at the low. But on this one, I decided to take 1,000 shares. I was like, okay, this thing has momentum. It's moving. I'm going to jump in. And now I've got a little bit of a cushion. I've got a $50 cushion. So I jumped in, but now, you know, it spikes from, let's see, t from 18, I got in at 19, it spiked up to a high of 32, and I was like, sweet, I'm up 100 bucks. Awesome. I put my order up on the ask to sell. 
I didn't get filled on the ask. And I started thinking, uh, this feels a little, a little risky because in the next candle, we dropped down to 316. And I went from being up 100 to down 30. I said, you know what? I'm just going to pop out of this thing. I got out at 322 for 30 cents, or for three cents. So three cents on a thousand shares is 30 bucks. But here's the problem. I bought with one order of 500 shares and then I pressed it a second time because I, I was not sure I wanted to do the thousand at first and then I decided to do it. So one entry, two entries, and then I tried to put out an order to sell some on the ask, some sold, but not the whole thing. So there's five bucks. And then I put out another order, to sell the rest, $20. I really only made about $10 on that trade. Actually, I think I made $8, you know, so I was risking like a hundred bucks and I only made $8. Just, you know, it's better to be break even than to red, but it's not exactly what I wanted. All right. So I ended up, um, you know, scalping this a couple times and you can see that my total profit is the first $70 plus 35 or whatever it is, is $107. But after commissions, it was only about 50 bucks, 60 bucks, maybe. So that was kind of disappointing and exemplified why you have to be really mindful about how much you trade. The next setup was Givo, which typically I don't like trading this stock, and they just did a reverse split. So as you guys know, I talk about float a lot. Every stock has a float. Now, when a company does their initial public offering, when they do an IPO, they're selling shares onto the market. So let's say a stock does a 10 million share IPO. 10 million shares were selling onto the market, and let's say they price it at $10. Well, when they sell those 10 million shares at $10, they've raised $100 million for the company. So that's good, that's, that's a good fundraiser, right? Raising capital, they can reinvest that in the company and you know, infrastructure, whatever. Well, from that point forward, every single day that we're trading, we're trading out of that pool of 10 million shares. 10 million shares is a fixed pool. So when I buy and sell, I'm trading out of that same pool of shares. Well, at any time, a company can do one of three things. The first they can do is a secondary offering. It's like they have their first IPO and then they do a second IPO, but it's not the initial now, it's a secondary. They do the secondary, so they let's say they decide to raise, they wanna raise another $100 million, so they sell another 10 million shares onto the open market. So. You know, they raise the money, they sell the shares, and now the float has gone from 10 million to 20 million. So a secondary offering dilutes the value of the company because you're releasing more of it onto the market and usually the price goes down. It's not usually good for long-term investors. It's something we see a lot with small caps. On the other hand, the company could do a share buyback program. You almost never see this with small caps because small cap companies don't have the money to do a share buyback. But a share buyback is something that Apple did uh, not too long ago. It's when they decide to actually pull some of the float out and buy it back. We're gonna buy back some of those shares that we released. When they do that, the float gets smaller. All right, so we know that stocks with floats under 100 million shares are more volatile. They make bigger moves. So it's possible that a heavy float stock can go down and float due to share buybacks and that a low float stock can go up and float due to secondary offerings. Okay, so those are the two things that we see fairly often. Now, a third thing that we see are splits, a stock split. So you guys know about Apple doing the seven to one stock split. The stock was priced at $700. They did a seven to one stock split and it dropped the price from 700 down to $100 per share. So if you were holding 1,000 shares at $700, you're now holding 7,000 shares at $7. It's a split doesn't actually change how much you own, but it does change the float. It changes the number of shares in that pool, and obviously it changes the price. Well, NYSE and NASDAQ require all companies to maintain a minimum price of $1 per share. So if a stock starts dropping down below a dollar, they can get a warning, which is, hey, you need to get your stock back up above a dollar, and you know this is the time where you have to do it by, if you don't do it, you're going to get delisted. You're going to get pulled off the exchange. That's not good for, for any company, right? That's not good for a stock. So they want to get their stock back up above a dollar. They can do that by doing a reverse split. So let's say the stock is priced at 10 cents. They can do a 10 to 1 reverse split where if you own 
10,000 shares at 10 cents, now you own 1,000 at a dollar. Okay, so they're reverse splitting, they're going up. Well, Givo just did a 20 to one, I believe it was 20 to one reverse split. So it was trading below a dollar, they do the reverse split, and now it's trading above a dollar. It's actually, you know, open today at $4 or whatever. Now, a lot of times when we see these companies do reverse splits, they end up um, squeezing kind of on the day of the split or within a couple days. They just sort of make this big move. I think maybe traders are just sort of all of a sudden see this new stock and they're like, oh, it's a low float stock. And guess what? The float, when you do that reverse split, those 10,000 shares turned into 1,000, so the float got smaller. All right, so now these stocks are even more volatile. They can make even faster moves. And this is a stock, Givo, that went from 350 today up to 535. That's a big move. So I jumped in on this one um, and with 1,000 shares, and I grabbed 11 cents of profit, which you know wasn't the biggest move ever. You can see um, this is the spike here. It spiked up and came all the way back down. And you can see my profit there, $112. So, you know, I'm, I'm happy with that. It was good, you know, decent trade. And you can see here how, if you look at the chart, sort of the big picture, it's just been getting weaker and weaker and weaker. I'll full screen this. It's just been selling off. Now, another stock that does reverse splits is GBSN. And you could see GBSN. Um, oh, actually, this is really interesting. Um, did they did they switch to OTC? Because now I can't. This chart's not right. So, well, in any case, um, they're another stock that did that's done a lot of re reverse splits, and the price just gets lower and lower and lower. So if we go back to Givo, you can see that every time they do the reverse split, the stock pops back up. You can see a couple of these pops here, and if you go back far enough, you realize that. You know, sometimes people ask me, is it true that Givo used to be priced at $103? And the answer is no, it's because of all the reverse splits that it looks like it was priced that high at one point. Uh, GBS, I mean, you can see, look, I, I mean, you could ask, at one point, was this priced at $8,000 a share? Because that's what it shows here, but the answer is no, it wasn't. It's the reverse splits that they keep doing that make that price, make it seem like it was priced higher. So this is something that's a little bit, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a weird thing that the, stock, that the companies are able to do. And, you know, we do see it um, fairly often in the small caps. But I don't usually trade stocks below a dollar anyways. So when they pop back up above a dollar, you know, it because, if it's from a reverse split or something else, then I'll take the trade. All right, guys. So um, here we are. Happy Friday. Burning the celebratory candle. There we go. We've got our 85 diesel. The smell of a 1985 diesel engine smells good. It smells like exhaust. It's a great smell. So I'm feeling good about the week. 106% gain. You know, $618. That's not bad. $618 a week. I mean, who wouldn't be happy with that? The incredible thing is that I did it with only $583 starting balance. So it's a good week. Next week, we'll see what I can do. My target for the end of the month, end of January, is at least $4,000. So, you know, that means next week, I mean, I'm up at 1,000, so I've got 3,000 to go. So 1,000 a week for the next three weeks is fine. Probably next week, I think I could beat 4,000. I actually, I really do. I think next week might be in the 700 to 1,000 range, but then as my account gets a little bit bigger, I'm gonna have more leverage. And that's what I talked about yesterday, the fact that um, you know, with every dollar that I make right now, I'm getting an extra $6 in buying power. So you know, today, as of right now, I've got $7,160 in buying power, and I can take 2,000 shares of a $3 stock. So that's pretty good. Now, the only risk is that if I lose 20 cents, I'm gonna lose 200 bucks, and I'll lose you know, $1,200 in buying power. So as it goes up, it can also come back down very quickly. And so until I have, I think I need a minimum of about $10,000 in buying power, 12, 10, 12,000 to, to trade pretty much the way I trade on any given day. Um, we'll look at my trades when I do my recap for the month of, or for the 2017, 2016 trading year. We'll see what my average position size was. I'm just looking right now. Looks like my average position size for the last few months 
has been about $26,000 per trade. You know, so but that's with an average share size of 7,000 shares. You know, so I'm not going to oh, actually sorry, that's the wrong column. I think it's it's still probably somewhere around there. Um, let's see. Average share size It's actually 5,000 shares. But, you know, in any case, I'm not going to be able to trade with that kind of size in the first few weeks or probably even the first month. And even if I had the buying power, I wouldn't want to risk the 20 or 30 cent loss on that kind of size because it's going to you know, knock me down too far and I'm not going to be able to afford it. So you know, for right now, I'll keep, keep myself a little bit more moderate. But I think once I have $10,000, $15,000 of buying power, I'll feel like I can start to be a little more aggressive. And once I get up to 20, 25,000 in buying power, I'll feel pretty, pretty confident. So remember, as soon as I have, you know, $4,000 in cash times six, right? Four times six, my buying power is really going up. So, you know, 4,000, four times six will be 24,000 in buying power. 5,000 will be 30,000 in buying power. So by the end of the month, really, I'll be able to trade almost the same as I was trading last year in my speed trader account. The challenge is all about building the account in the first few weeks. And I, I knew that that would be the hardest part. The hardest part is the first couple of weeks. And then once you have that buffer, then you've got some room to work. So in a lot of ways, I've been fortunate. Um, the first, let's see, so far this week in my speed, my share trader account, I've traded, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, let's see, eight, nine, ten, eleven, I've taken eleven trades, and I haven't had one loser. I mean, that's a little bit of luck to be on an eleven trade hot streak, uh, but, you know, I've been very, very specific and very, very um, you know, picky about what I'm willing to trade. I haven't been trading as much. I mean, only 11 trades. It's, you know, not, haven't been taking a lot of trades. I've been really like, it has to be a quality setup or I'm not going to take it at all. All right. So I'm seeing, I'm going to look at a couple of the comments you guys are posting. Um, now for those of you watching on Facebook, um, let's see, I'll check your comments. So look at GSAT, GSAT. Now I can tell you right now that I'm actually not the biggest fan of this stock. Um, if we look at the float on GSAT, and I'll show you right here, it's a 406 million share float stock. So remember when I said my float is, I don't like anything under over 100 million? Well, this is over 100 million. And on a typical day, it trades pretty much sideways. I mean, this moved a little bit. It's had a total range today of 15 cents, right? But look at, let's just scroll back and look at yesterday. That's how it traded yesterday. It's like, I mean, it's just pinned right between this price. And then look at the level two. You've got so many buyers and sellers on either side. This just isn't a stock that makes big moves. All right, so that's not one that I would use uh, for a day trade. Regardless of the daily chart, it's just, it's too thickly traded and it doesn't usually make, um, make good moves. So for me, I can reduce my risk as a trader by only focusing on the stocks that have the potential to move you know, 20 to 30% intraday. And granted, it doesn't take a lot for a $1.50 price stock to move 30%, but I still wouldn't uh, generally go for, for GSAT. Um, all right, so any other questions? Um, let's see, give you guys a chance to ask some questions. Theodore talking about a gold stock. So I'm not a big fan of trading commodities. Um, I just... You know, what I go for are stocks that have an actual catalyst. Like a, like a commodity is going to have sector-wide catalyst or maybe global catalyst. So like when you trade oil or you trade gold or silver, you're trading kind of, it's sort of like a derivative because you're trading the price based on the price of something else. So like when the market goes down, gold goes up usually. So you could be like, oh, I'm buying gold because something else is doing something. And derivatives are just a little bit trickier for for most day traders. I mean, some like them, but I'm not the biggest fan. Um, so let's see, what else do you guys want me to look at? 
Jivo, Muhammad, yeah, I mean, not, there wasn't much there. Oh, C-A-N-F, yeah, that's one of those ones um, that you can see. This one is it's kind of a, a stock that has just been selling off for a while. It's fairly weak. I mean, it's at 245 right now, but the float on it, C-A-N-F, is 12.38 million shares. So I, they used to be lower. So I would say they've probably done a secondary offering at least once or twice um, to get the price or to get the float that high. You know, it's one of those stocks that when it has a catalyst, it's worth jumping on. But until then, I don't usually trade it. Oh, there's another one, Live, L-I-V-E, Live Ventures. This one, they've done some reverse splits on as well. And you can see since they did their reverse split, the price went up to $32 a share, and since then it's just been selling off. Now it's at 18. Um, all right, so let's see. Hey, Daryl. ANY, I can check that one. I'm not familiar with that stock though. Um, and ETRM at this point, I wouldn't trade it going into the afternoon. Yeah, so ANY is a is a penny stock, and I don't trade stocks below a dollar. Um, I'm not sure. Let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm not sure what market it's on. It doesn't. I don't think it's OTC. I'm not sure, but um, yeah, I, I wait for them to get above a dollar, and really above three dollars is better. And that's especially true with this uh, Sure Trader challenge because I can't trade stocks below $3, no margin. Margin restriction is $3 and up. Anything below $3 is one to one. So my sweet spot zone right now is between $3 and $6 because those are stocks that I can definitely take 1,000 shares on. And some of them I could even take 1,500 on or 2,000. With the buying power of 7,100, anything $7.10, 16 or lower, I can take a thousand shares on. Uh, so those are ones that I would be willing to trade right now. Going well so far, building up that cushion off the $500 minimum. That was the hard part. I knew, you know, the first couple days I needed to have really good accuracy and a little bit of luck. You know, I actually thought today that possibly Jivo with a thousand shares at $5 would squeeze up to 535. My target was 550. And I was like, this could be the one that gives me that $500 winner because, you know, five times six, that'll increase my buying power by $3,000. That's pretty big. I mean, that's, that's a really big deal. If I can get a $500 winner, a thousand shares with 50 cents, that's all I need. I thought that one could be the one. It just didn't open up. So, you know, I'll keep searching. And it's all about right now being very, very, um, you know, very, very patient. And it's hard. It's an exercise in patience. And, you know, th this morning, every morning so far this week when I've sat down, I've been feeling like a little nervous because I really don't want to screw up this account. I mean, I know that we've all had losses and I'm, I'm transparent about my losses. I mean, I, I talk about my best days and my worst days, but it's been a long time since I was trading an account that if I had a bad day, I might have to put more money in. And the first four days, you know, the first five, 10 days are the hardest of this challenge. You know, they talk about with trading. Here's the thing. Let's, let me give you an example. If you have a $100,000 account and you lose 50% of it, you're down to 50,000. What percentage gain do you need to make in order to get back to where you started? You lost 50% and now what do you need to make percentage wise to get back to where you started? 100%. Now you need to double your account. That's hard. That's, I mean, it's really hard. It's easy to lose half and then it's really hard to double. So, you know, this is just the area where the odds are stacked against you and you have to be almost like, you know, superhuman and just a master of your emotions to come out every day ahead of the market. So I'm feeling good today and happy to finish this week green Today, I overtraded a little bit, $70 in commissions. You know, Earlier in the week, I wasn't scaling out. I, I was just one entry, one exit. And today, I scaled out a couple times. 
And, you know, I did that because I wasn't as confident, but I felt like, you know what, I could sell the whole thing right now, but then I've, what I've done is I've capped the potential of this trade because now it's definitely not going to be like a $500 winner or something. So I was like, I'll sell half, and then if it keeps running, I'll, I'll get a profit on the rest. And if it doesn't, well, at least I got a little something. So being a little, you know, letting things ride a little bit more since I have a bigger cushion, and I think that's, that's okay. All right, so, um, all right, guys, well, that's where we're at today. Any questions, feel free to email me. Otherwise, I will see you first thing on Monday morning. I hope you guys all have a great weekend. All right, thanks, everyone.